Welcome to Michigan Out of Doors. I'm Jenny Olson, and on this week's show, we're going to take you up for the 2014 sturgeon spearing season that happened on Black Lake the first weekend in February. It was one of the quickest seasons on record. You won't want to miss that. We've got some other brand new adventures for you this week, too. Well, that's right, Jenny. After the sturgeon story, we're going to head south where we're going to take part in a coyote calling tournament. Those are getting to be more and more popular here in the state of Michigan. You won't want to miss that. We're also going to stop in with a brand new call manufacturer here in the state of Michigan. And if we have some time, we got a little recipe with our good friend Kelly Gotch. Lots of good stuff on this week's show, so you stay tuned. I'm Jimmy Gretzinger. It's time for Michigan Out of Doors. From the first spring rains to the soft summer breeze, dancing on the pine forest floor. The autumn colors catch your eyes, here come the crystal winter skies. It's Michigan, Michigan out of doors. Someday our children all will see this is their finest legacy. The wonder and the love of Michigan as the wind comes whispering through the trees. The sweet smell of nature's in the air. Great Lakes to the quiet stream, shining like a sportsman's dream. It's a love of Michigan we all share. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by by Greenstone Farm Credit Services, making recreational land ownership possible across Michigan and Northeast Wisconsin. Begin your land financing journey at one of Greenstone's 37 locations or visit greenstonefcs.com. By Meyer, a destination for hunting, fishing, and camping. From bug spray and tents to GPS and gas, Meyer has nearly everything you need to take on nature and get you there. Meyer. By Zimmer Roofing and Construction in Port Huron, featuring Duralast roofing systems made in Michigan. Zimmer Roofing and Construction provides installation, maintenance, service, and repair, serving commercial and residential clients on the web at zimmerroofing.com. By Country Smokehouse, offering a variety of meat products, Country Smokehouse is located three miles south of I-69 on M53, just south of Imlay City. Country Smokehouse is a meat processor, a butcher, and a destination for sportsmen. Sturgeon spearing season here in Onaway is a much anticipated event every year. This year the season began on February 1st, so the day before the opener, anglers registered at the DNR field office and gathered their licenses, ID flags, and got a rundown on the rules and regulations for this once a year event. On hand at registration were Sturgeon for Tomorrow President Brenda Archambo and DNR Director Keith Craig, who was enjoying all the fun that surrounds the season. So what is going on? It is my first time on Black Lake for sturgeon. I fished walleyes here, but this is a great event this winter day. So Black Lake can give up a 12 sturgeon this year, um, and six of the sturgeon go to the tribes, and the other six go to the recreational anglers. But we went over a couple of years ago, so we're in the penalty box. We're available for five. Okay. And But there's a lot of hoopla going on about it, and, and what it really is is a, a conservation success story where by... The fishery was potentially going to be shut down, um, and the angler said, hold on just a minute, it's pretty deeply entrenched in our culture, what do we need to do to make that not happen? And we had to have a building self-sustaining spawning stock. We're making progress, yeah, and um, the collaboration has been great. So, awesome. so we'll probably have a couple hundred people out on the ice tomorrow. The Shivery's on the uh, the other end of the lake, and we've got a band starting out in the tents here at 6 o'clock. Over at the Shivery tent, things were already getting started. Jim Felgenauer is the president of the Sturgeon for Tomorrow chapter down in the Detroit area and made the trek up here to check things out. Why they let anybody in here? Yeah, it's first time for everything, you know. <laughs> What do you think? Is this your first sturgeon spearing season or no? First sturgeon spearing season. And you know, Brenda always puts on a good party, so you got to come up. You know, for sure. Oh, yeah, it's great. You know, things are just getting fired up, so uh, it's going to be a fun time tonight. It's going to be a great season tomorrow, too. Water conditions are good. Everybody's optimistic. So After dark, the anglers and community headed outside to take part in a celebration with a local Native American tribe. Here on Black Lake, we are standing on Black Lake as we speak, and the sturgeon and Black Lake swim here, and we are giving our honor to them because they're available for harvest uh, for the Black Lake sturgeon season. So we've got uh, some balloons here, actually, that we're going to lift off in honor of the Name Lake Sturgeon uh, here in the Great Lakes. We're celebrating Black Lake Sturgeon 
and the fish that are available for harvest. And really, it's about the people of the sturgeon too, Jenny, um, and all the work that's been done over the last few decades. So um, enjoy. Members of the tribe performed a pipe ceremony and a chant song to commemorate the start of the 2014 season. The next morning, anglers hit the ice. They stopped to check in with the DNR on their way out to their spearing shacks. In years past, licenses were given out on a lottery basis for the small number of fish we were allowed to take as a state, and only a handful of anglers were able to participate each year, depending on the sturgeon quota for the season. Now it's open to anyone who wants to try their hand at it. With more anglers on the ice, the season has the potential to be over quickly. Everyone wants to make sure they're poised and ready when the season begins at 8 a.m. Happy sturgeon season. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, Nate Howell. Are you from here, Nate? Yeah, Sheboygan. Cool. So yeah. you're an old pro at looking for sturgeon? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Just picked it up a few years ago. Did and, you? Yeah. Have you ever seen one down there? Uh, nope. All right. No. I was talking to a guy last night who said it's going to be a good year. He's yeah. Seen. They say it's going to go quick, but they said that last year too, and it <laughs> lasted three days. So yeah, cool. We'll see. Who are you out here with? Uh, I got some buddies of mine, the Stem Keys are next to me. We uh, fish together every year. Cool. So. All right. You got the setup here, Oh, man. yeah. So you're pretty hardcore, huh? Yeah, I stayed, <laughs> stayed right here last night and turned it into a motel room, and now it's back to a fish, Annie. Seriously? <laughs> yeah, got the tr caught in the truck and. That is Sleeping cool. Bag. Yeah. Did the other guys stay too? No, they went in. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. wow, it's got to be nice and quiet out here. Oh, it was something. <laughs> got cold enough, you hear the ice crack and making more ice. It awesome. Was, that was your alarm clock this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you. The clock chimed eight bells and the 2014 sturgeon spearing season was underway. All over the lake, there were folks sitting in the darkness of their shanties, staring down into the water. Some guys take it so seriously that they weren't really willing to shoot the breeze with my camera and lights in their faces while precious seconds ticked away. I was just making my way to the famed 30-footer shack when I heard the news that there were already two sturgeon taken. There are three fish on the ice. Three? We, three fish that we know of. What time is it? It is almost 9 a.m. on the opening day of sturgeon season. It's February 1st. And uh, we know there's a 90 pounder out there. There's two more. We're waiting for them to come in so that we can register them and see what their gender is, if they've been tagged and netted before. And um, pretty exciting. Dan Stroop from Bronson, Michigan, was the first of the day to spear a sturgeon. His tipped the scales at 90 pounds. <laughs> Have you been sturgeon spearing before? 33 years. Oh, is this your first one? Eighth. Eighth sturgeon. Yep, yep. Nice. In, That's the, so in cool. the last in the last 13 years. Wow. Yeah. So tell me how it all played out for you. Uh, well, we got the hole ready this morning, <clears throat> put the decoy down, and uh, waited, and in about five to seven minutes, it comes sliding in right under the decoy. And I threw the spear. Sweet. All happy. And I hit it. <laughs> <laughs> While we all celebrated with Dan, more news came rolling in. No, there's, there's four fish on the ice now, and it is opening day. It's 9.15 in the morning, and it uh, season started an hour and 15 minutes ago. Fish number two was on its way to the check-in. P.D. Lael Jr. of Sheboygan speared this dandy that weighed in at 57 and a half pounds. P.D. is a well-seasoned spearer, and this is the third sturgeon he's taken over the years. The season was definitely going to be a short one this year. The season's closed as of 9.19 a.m. on February 1st. So that was it. The fifth sturgeon had been speared and the season was officially over. Sturgeon number three was just coming in. Scott Ash from Onaway speared this bruiser of a male that measured 66 inches long and 70 pounds. Scott was on cloud nine. Have you done this before? For about six, seven years. Oh, cool. Is this the first one you've... First one I've ever speared. Congratulations. Yep. That's so cool. Yep. What time did he swim through? About 20 after eight. Nice. So just one throw of the spear and... It was all over. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a lot heavier than I thought he was going to yeah? be, that's for sure. Congratulations. Yeah. So what did you use as a decoy? I used a rust vial, red and white. All right. Decoy's a local carver yeah. and a uh, sucker minnow. And Beautiful. Come right in five feet under the ice, stuck them, and then the panic started. <laughs> <laughs> Fisheries research biologist Ed Baker says they've seen some of these sturgeon before. 
two of them are fish that we've caught in the spawning run in the river, yes. Okay. Um, the first one that came in was a large female that we caught in, I think it was 2007. And then this fish here is a male we caught in 2005 and then again in 2010 and 2012. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. As fish number four made its way in, I caught up with longtime sturgeon angler Bob Garner. Isn't this cool? Oh, I mean, yeah. this is just, this is just, just something that the whole... The whole fish coming back and the hatcheries and everybody getting involved and everybody being able to fish. Uh, Jenny, I never thought I'd see uh, this day when, when things were looking pretty glum. This is very cool. Yeah, very, very cool. cool. Very cool indeed. As fish number five got checked in, anglers were packing up their shanties to head out. Lots of us, like Dave Gregg, were in disbelief that it was already over. I'm glad we didn't sleep, sleep in because uh, it's over at 922. <laughs> Bad day. Have you ever seen it go this fast? No, no, this is a record, I'm sure. I've never seen it go this fast. And then a sixth fish came in. It turns out the fifth and sixth sturgeon were speared almost simultaneously. Charlie Maltby from Sheboygan was able to take this 56-inch long fish that weighed 34 pounds. I asked fisheries chief Jim Dexter about taking six fish instead of five. Yeah, we do have six, and that's okay. Our allocation this year was six fish. We established the season. Um, our harvest that we would actually do is five, and that's to give us a buffer so that we don't go over the number of fish that we've been allocated. Okay. So between the tribes and the state, it's a 12 fish uh, limit and it's split evenly between the tribes and the state. All so right. we did a great job this Sounds year. Perfect. The anglers had a great time. Cool. This is pretty amazing that the fishery was over within 90 minutes. Yeah. Uh, but the conditions were really good. It's a great weather day. First good day for 2014. We got a great turnout out here. It went really, really well. Cool. Congratulations to all of the successful anglers who took part in this year's sturgeon spearing season, and to all the folks who work hard all year long to protect this incredible resource and make sure we're able to keep this tradition going strong. Hi, I'm Jordan Brown, and for our next story, I was down in the Kalamazoo area covering the inaugural Great Lakes Region Predator Challenge held at DNR Sports. For this year's contest, I would be tagging along with good friend of the show, Todd Sullivan, and his hunting partner, Matt, for the final morning of the hunt, hoping to get a successful coyote kill on camera before the weigh-in. These guys already had one coyote down, but we're hoping for more. Of course, last night when we don't have the camera, I get probably the, one of the best uh, calls, uh, coyote coming in, hard charger, 30 yards out, stop broadside, and I, I rolled it a couple of times with a 12-gauge shotgun. Of course, that's probably the only time we didn't have the, the camera with us. So we went out the next morning, uh, kind of a new spot, but we saved it. I wasn't really familiar with it, but my hunting partner was. We went out there, you know, everything looked good. It was kind of windy, but we snuck out. We got kind of down in an area where there was a, a low spot, and we gave it all we had. But once again, same kind of thing. If there's no coyote tracks, which we didn't see any, there's probably no coyotes. Coyotes are interested in two things, food and safety. And if they're food and safety, they'll generally stay in that area. But if not, they'll travel a long ways to find one of those two things. So fresh sign is important. We got snow on the ground. You got to go out there. You got to find those fresh tracks. And you got to hunt where the coyotes are. They're looking for food right now. Rabbits, if there's a lot of rabbits, you generally find coyote tracks. But just to go out and, and hunt and call the area where you saw coyotes when you were deer hunting doesn't necessarily mean that those coyotes are still, still there. After leaving our first setup empty-handed, we headed off to a different area, about 10 miles away, hoping for a better result. This area was significantly more open than the last and would make for great footage if we could get a coyote to cooperate. We hunted uh, the second spot. It was a, a cut hay field with some hay bales, and we went out. The wind wasn't in the best direction. We had actually been there uh, and called the day before. There were some old tracks, but the wind wasn't right, so we couldn't set up in really the ideal place that we wanted to. We gave it a shot. This is the way that I almost start out all my stands, and I don't care if it's in the middle of the summer or the, like we are right now in the middle of January. I like to start out my stands with a couple friendly howls, and then I'll go into some distress. There's no magic call sound out there. Uh, you know, I've tried them all. I bought every call there, there ever was. You really, uh, just gotta stay with the basics. There's some electronic calls out there that'll have three or 400 different sounds. I have no idea what you would do with all those sounds. So I'm a pretty basic caller. I start out with some howling. I love to howl. 
That's when the fun starts, when they start talking back and they're yipping and yapping and growling at you. And then just some basic distress. A good old rabbit in distress call that's called in more coyotes than all the other coyote sounds combined. That's your go-to call, never leave home without it. Calling coyotes is one of the more difficult things we film here at the show. And once again, we couldn't manage to get it done. After wrapping up our second set, it was time to head back to the weigh-in and see how everyone else had done. Yeah, this is a uh, first year uh, Predator Great Lakes Region Predator Challenge. Uh, we're here at uh, DNR Sports in Kalamazoo off of M43, uh, home of uh, Randy Van Dam and uh, his crew. Uh, we are uh, putting together, uh, this is kind of a, an adjunct to uh, some previous hunts that we had helped organize and marshal in, in Calhoun County. So this is kind of the first year in this format. Uh, we had about 120 hunters uh, participate in the hunt. And we took uh, 20 animals, 19 uh, coyotes, and uh, one fox. 20 animals for what is essentially a 36-hour tournament was pretty impressive, especially considering the brutal weather conditions. After I checked out some of the animals, I had Scott walk me through what happens after the guys get checked in. At that time, the hunters will come back. They'll check their animals in. We uh, go through a check-in process where we weigh the animals. Uh, we'll additionally uh, take the core temperatures and take the information down on each animal harvested so that we can report that back at the end of the event. Uh, the hunters then come in, they get a hot meal. It was especially cold this weekend, so uh, the hot meal is very welcome. They'll come in and uh, sit down, Barrett's will serve them up a meal. They uh, will have a seminar available. Todd Sullivan, again, uh, was doing the seminar. And uh, then we go through the award ceremony and wrap it up. So it's, uh, the guys are usually pretty tired by the time they get back in here. Uh, come Sunday, a lot of them hunting for 36 hours straight, and uh, you can kind of see evidence as I'm sitting up here uh, going through. So we keep it uh, as short and as brief as possible. It took six coyotes to win this year's contest and three to place. Great numbers when you factor in just how difficult they can be to call in. Special thanks to Todd, Matt, and Scott for inviting me down for this year's contest. And if you're looking to do some competitive hunting or just looking to learn a little bit more about coyote hunting in general, contests like this one are a great place to start. Well, calling coyotes has become more and more popular here in the state of Michigan, and as you can see, it is not one of the easiest things to get on tape. What we're going to do right now is kind of stay in that same vein of calling critters to you, and we're going to stop in with a new Michigan call manufacturer. A few weeks back, a buddy introduced me to a new call maker here in Michigan, and when I saw just how beautiful the calls were, well, I thought it was worth the trip just south of Lansing to see the handiwork of Mike Perkins. Each one is going to be a little bit different because I'm cutting them by hand, but um, there's a certain shape that I shoot for and I, I usually get it just about every time, um, but there'll be very minute differences between the, uh, each call that I make. So. The small differences between the calls is actually part of why these are so special. They are all handmade, not mass produced, and very unique. In our calls, you can call us and we will hand make you one out of any wood you would like. If you got a special wood you have, that we've had a, a gentleman have wood passed down three generations from his grandfather that had a wood shop and they've made knife blade or handles and stuff. He says, if I send it to you, will you make it? Yeah, yeah. And that call means more to him now because it's turned into that. He's ecstatic. We get people putting them on their mantles that don't want to use them, but they're made to use. These calls, yeah, they're beautiful calls, but they're made to use. Okay, so that's trued up. It's ready to be cut um, in normal, if I were making this call for a client though, I would uh, cut this down a little bit further and start taking some measurements. Mike makes grunt calls, predator calls, duck calls, and even getting into turkey calls as well. From just a small shop in his basement, who knows where all this will go. At this point now, um, you'd just be ready to start sanding the call. And uh, that's probably gonna take you three, four times the time to sand it than it did just to shape it. Sand, sanding is the biggest part, so. Um, you want to make sure that that is smooth for when we put a finish on it. Um, it just you don't want any bubbles in it or anything like that because that could ruin the you know the finish over time. So, well, what drew me to stop in and see some of Mike's calls was the way they look. But don't be too worried; they sound pretty good as well. This here is set on. This is set on tending buck. Okay. And then you've got. Uh, you can run it up to dominant buck. This is going to be a little bit deeper tone. 
and all these calls have the same range. I mean, you can all you can take this all the way out to a fawn ball as well, and it'll sound good. So you go from that to the deepest grunt. You know, I think that you'd need tube calls are same concept with the reed system. Same thing. Um, these calls the the air that you blow into this call has a lot more room to travel here, so it's it's a deeper tone. You'll see here, and a lot of people like that too. Um, actually, these calls are sell for less than what these calls do. So um, a lot of people like these calls because you can get that deep tone, or you can take it back and adjust it down to a foam ball. So you still got that real young tone all the way up to a you know a dominant buck with those tube calls. So depending on whether you're looking for a grunt tube or a predator call, the wood options, well, they are endless. The colors and the different looks that the wood has really sets it apart from most calls that we take to the woods. I'm a little bit different than most uh, call makers would make them, especially with the grunt calls. Um, that I'm aware of, you won't find another grunt call out there with that same barrel. Um, and that was the whole idea behind this whole thing is when I started it, I wanted to, I wanted to make a, a, a call that sounded as realistic as possible, but I wanted it to look good and I wanted somebody, when they bought it, I wanted them to be able to hand it down, you know, to their son or their grandkids or what have you. So um, <clears throat> to be totally honest with you, out of all the calls I've sold, I've not had one complaint yet. Not, I'm sure it's going to happen someday, but um, not one complaint so far. So we're really proud about that. Um, a lot of big deer on the ground this year because of these calls. So we're, uh, we're enjoying it right now. Well, will Timber Freak calls be the next Duck Dynasty? Well, only time will tell. But until then, we just hope they keep making some great looking calls. Well, hey, we are here today in my kitchen with good friend Kelly Gotch. Kelly, how many years did you host Michigan Outdoors with me? I was co-hosting for about four years. Four years. She's been gone for a few years, and we still keep in touch. And we're doing a little cooking with Kelly today. And what's kind of interesting about what we're going to do, we're going to show some appetizers and a couple venison dishes, but more so than the recipes, which I think you'll be, they're easy to try. I think you're going to like them. But really, we're here today because of kind of how we're going to be cooking them. And this is a Hot Logic Mini, and Kelly kind of put me onto this. They're kind of cool. Just tell the folks, what, what is this? Well, this is essentially a slow cooker, but I like to call it a smart cooker because it does all the thinking for you. It has a computer chip in it that basically computes the density of the food, which, hmm. how, have you ever heard of that before? Yeah, no. <laughs> it computes the density of your food, and the reason it does that is because it won't overcook it, and it won't undercook it. So it's going to heat your food to the perfect serving temperature, and it will hold it at that temperature for up to 12 hours. Which I thought was really cool because when Kelly was kind of telling me about this, the application for deer camp or turkey camp, or even if you're out ice fishing because these can plug into a power converter in your truck, but you could have them, if you go out in the morning and you you know put some venison in the dish and you come back late at night, you got a hot and meal. If, if you're like me, you always have that proverbial one more cast when you're out fishing. Yeah. So if you're a few hours late, you don't need to worry because this is not going to overcook or dry out your food. Okay. You won't lose any nutritional value or any moisture. So it's going to be Perfect, hot, and ready to eat whenever you're ready to well, eat. Well, I'm kind of excited to try some of these recipes. So let's start. We we're going to show a couple appetizers and a couple kind of venison dishes that are more of like an entree kind of a thing. But let's hop into the first one. What do we got here first? We've got hot wings to start off. These are some pretty simple and easy recipes you may just want to try. For the wings, we did brown them a little bit before putting them in, but you don't have to. Simply add a pound and a half of wings, a third of a cup of your favorite wing sauce, put in a teaspoon of cider vinegar, as well as a half a teaspoon of Worcestershire sauce, and about a clove or so of minced garlic. We topped it with a little black pepper, and folks, that is it. Simply mix and pour all of that over the wings and place in the portable oven. Or if you'd like to try these at home, if you don't have one of those, you can use a slow cooker as well. Now we did a dip as well while Kelly was here. We simply combined 14 ounce can of artichoke hearts, chopped them up a little bit, added some sauteed onion, some bell pepper, two ounces of blue cheese, four ounces of cream cheese and sour cream and mix and you're done. These little Hot Logic ovens were pretty neat and would be a great tool up at Deer Camp. All the recipes are on our website, and stay tuned for next week where we show you two different venison recipes to try in these portable ovens. 
Thanks for joining us this week for Michigan Out of Doors. Make sure you check us out online. You can do that a couple of different ways on our Facebook page at Michigan Out of Doors TV or on our website at michiganoutofdoorstv.com. Lots of fun stuff happening on there. You can check out our older episodes or this week's episode if you'd like to see it over again. And we've got a lot of brand new stuff coming up for you over the next few weeks. Well, that's right, Jenny. There is a lot to do this time of the year and we've been out doing some ice fishing recently. In fact, right now as I'm talking to you, Gabe Van Warmer and Jordan Brown are out on Saginaw Bay chasing walleye. We'll see how that story turns out. And then it's hard to believe, but Big Buck Night East down there at Outdoorama is next week in Novi on Thursday night. We start taping around 7 p.m. So if you're in the area, stop on by. We'd love to see you. And uh, coming up next month, we have Big Buck Night West. That's going to be in Grand Rapids at the Ultimate Sports Show. So lots of good stuff coming over the next few weeks here in Michigan out of doors. Make sure you get outside. There is a lot to do right now. And if we don't see it in the woods or on the water, we'll see you right back here next week on your PBS station. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by By Showspan, producing consumer shows including Outdoor Rama February 27th through March 2nd at Novi's Suburban Collection Showplace. The show features tackle, trips, boats, outfitters, wildlife encounters, and of course, Big Buck Night. That's Outdoor Rama in Novi February 27th through March 2nd. By Pictured Rocks Boat Cruises of Munising, exploring Lake Superior's Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore with its sandstone cliffs, caves, waterfalls, and lighthouses. Pictured Rocks Boat Cruises on the web at picturedrocks.com. Buy propane, exceptional energy. Propane retailers promote the safe use of Michigan-produced gas energy in homes, farms, and businesses across our great state. Learn more at usemichiganpropane.com. Buy Meyer, a destination for hunting, fishing, and camping. From bug spray and tents to GPS and gas, Meyer has nearly everything you need to take on nature and get you there. Meyer. Closed captioning is brought to you by Propane Exceptional Energy. Propane retailers promote the safe use of Michigan produced gas to outdoor enthusiasts across our great state. When I want a far away, a dream stays with me night and day. It's the road that leads to my home state. I am a Michigan man. Changing seasons paint the scene like rainbow trout in a hidden stream. The white-tailed deer in the tall pine trees. I am a Michigan man. I am, I am a Michigan man. Ask where I'm from and I'll show you my hands. Lord above, I love this land. I am a Michigan man.